So how did you get to meet Kim Wilde? I'd known Kim for a little while. We'd do Top of the Pops and things like this together, right? We, we would talk, but not really sit down and have a chat and stuff like this. And then I got a phone call from her saying that she wanted to do... Yeah, Sean, that's... There you go. Great song. Thank you, man. Wanted to do... She said she wanted to do a duet, right? And um, at the time, Michael McDonald and uh, Patti LaBelle had done On My Own. I love that song. Great song. And I just kept thinking, again, that's what America does. They do a lot. You're right. They do the collaborations. They do the collaborations, but it's always... From, uh, or should I say, it's more so from an R and B perspective. It's pretty true. much, it's always pretty much R and B, right? That they do, and I didn't want to do that. Kim wanted to do that because obviously she'd seen what that was. So she was like, "Well, we can do a track which is more." And I was like, "Hell no! Let's let's let's." <laughs> She's like, "What do you mean, hell no?" I'm like, "Hell no!" Right? So you know, they wanted to do pictures that weren't black and white. They wanted to do nice gloss colour pictures, again, all following the American pattern of how to do things. My success was based off of the fact of not following the Americans, right, but doing it from a British perspective. So I thought, no, what we'll do, let's get edgy, we'll do black and white. I'm not sure people's going to like that, Junior. I said, like, stick with me, Kim, just stick with me, right? So we did the black and white pictures and stuff, and I loved them because they were, like, so not American. And then when Ricky came up with... Which is um, her brother. Her brother. Who, who does some like, music, yes, if people didn't know. Yeah. So Ricky came up with this song and was asking me, what do you think? So I said, it doesn't have... And here's the cliche to it now. I'm saying it doesn't have that soul edge on top that will make it different to your synth thing. So we need to mess with what you've done. So we spent maybe what... Ricky and I spent maybe like a day, two days, just working that out. And then I came down, me and Kim was in. I'm telling Kim how I figured that she should sing this part and sing that part. And it was a great union. And when we did the song, it really was a great union. And when we did this song, I always remember, because it was coming out on MC, I think it was it came out on MCA. Yeah, yes. It didn't come out. she was signed to. She was signed to, yeah. yeah. I remember my record company, which at that time was London Record. Oh, gosh. It'll never work. It's a load of rubbish tune. I don't know why you bothered to do it, this, that and the other. A couple of weeks later, it's it's at number six in the charts, right? And it's on number three in France and number so-and-so in Germany and number this here. And I get phone calls, you know. Oh, I know I said it was rubbish, but I'm really feeling that song, Jude. You know, I think you need to go back in with her and cut something else. And, you know, we could do it on our label. I did go in and I did cut another track, which was on her album to make sure it was on her album. I wouldn't right. do it for them. To hell yeah. with you, right? I knew what you were coming, where you were coming yeah. from. After we did that, we got asked to do the Michael Jackson tour, which completely messed up everybody. <laughs> so she was supporting Michael Jackson on the Bad Tour, right? That's right. And then you would get up and do it, that I song think, with her, yeah. in front of all those audiences. Did yeah. you get to meet Michael as well? Yes, I did. Wow. Right. Um, that was a... At the height of his fame, just after yeah, Thriller. So just after that Thriller. That must have been amazing. That, that, that tour was incredible, man. And Sheryl Crow was the backing singer, you know that. Yeah, I know. I oh, love yeah. Sheryl Crow. I met her too, wasn't that? Wow, well, so, of course. Right? That's how I met her. Yeah, On sure. that tour. But it was incredible. Um, I had, I had, we'd done the first, first Wembley show. I think and I went, actually. Yeah, <laughs> that first <laughs> Wembley show. And we did that show and... I was in the dressing room with Kim and her family and I got a um, knock on the door, right? And this guy turns and says, uh, is Junior in there? So I think at the time Kim was going out with the guy from, what was that band? It was a band that was having um, early hits at the time. And uh, um, he answered the door and the guy said, is Junior in there? So he said, yeah, so who wants him? And the guy says, uh, Michael Jackson wants to meet him. So he got well pissed off because Michael didn't ask to meet Kim. <laughs> <laughs> didn't bother me though. I understood yeah. where Michael was coming okay. from. So I went and I met Michael. And uh, that's when he told me that like he, his sister introduced him to mummy used to say, 
and he saw the video. Which sister, Janet? Or Janet. Janet. Okay. He saw the he saw the video, loved the video. He said, "I stole some of your moves, man," which cracked me up. Oh, wow. He said, "No, seriously, I stole some of your moves and stuff like this. Things that you would do." I'm like, oh, mate. So again, you're kind of like, you're touching people in all kinds of different areas, Jimmy. Absolutely. And you're not really taking it on board. Here's Michael Jackson telling you that what you did, right, I had to look at properly. And, and here's Stevie Wonder saying what you were doing. And all of these different artists were coming and, and giving me so much love. You know, one of my best was Rick James, who became a huge yeah, friend, as I yeah. said, a huge friend for me, right, when he was alive. And, uh, that was fantastic. So I was in a, I was in a, a and Prince, a unique... you mentioned in Jam and Lewis, we had the, you in Minneapolis for a few months. A few months there? as well. Yeah. I spent time down there during a, a period of time where I had gotten fed up with the music industry, fed up with the fighting, basically. I just didn't get in this to keep fighting people. I did, I got in it to make music. So I went to Minneapolis and I worked down there for three months and, um, with Monty Moore, met up with Jam and Lewis in the time and, 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 uh, Prince and it was three months that that made it that I'm still in this industry if it wasn't for those three months with those people and their encouragement and their laughter we laughed a lot and support like you, you're saying to me that you'd all listen to what you were doing yeah. and, and, and we had know. fantastic times we'd be late at night after we'd been recording everybody would come into the studio and play what they would do for the day and, you know, Prince would come in and he'd play something and me, me and he'd sit back and Jim and Terry and think like, Jesus Christ, hold on a minute. Right, so then everybody would, we'd talk for a little bit, right, and then everybody would leave, right, and we'd go back to the studio and we'd come up with something. So now, when you're ready now to come following night, I'm ready for you, man. I'm ready for you, right? So Prince would come in and, you know, he'd play something and we'd be like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. And what you guys been up to? And we put in something, and we both wouldn't look at one another, you know. Right? So, and you know, if he doesn't talk, right, that's it. It's a bomb. And we're there, and the tune would play. He's talking at first, and tune would play, and no talking. And as it's done, damn man, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a <laughs> loved it. And that was what kept that's me. Funny. That's what that's what kept me oh, in this industry. Cool. Those Very guys cool. helped me to see that like you need to ensure that you're making the music that you want to make from your heart because otherwise right. when you stand on that stage you will not be able to project that crap that they've been giving you to do sure you become the crap that you've been given to do and you know i think they're very 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 underrated producers i mean they've had oh. amazing success with change you were talking about mm. and jam you know nice. and uh, janet jackson and everybody. sounds of blackness everybody everybody and they're, they're probably what some of they're definitely some of my uh, producers ever i love i mean jam and lewis i love to death i i, I <laughs> um la and face were the yes, other they were the other team yeah who were at big and, at that uh, time as well yeah la and face were, were about to do bobby brown that's and really um gosh. their manager Ray also managed Bob Marley back really? in the day. Oh, wow. So uh, I knew their manager. So when I got to America, their manager was straight on me. Hey, I got some guys you gotta meet. Hey, who's that? Hey, these two guys, not Jam and Lewis. Uh, not Jam and Lewis. Right? He said, haven't you heard that record? Roses are red, because that was huge by a group called the Map Band. That's right. Right? And it became huge. And he said to me, ain't you heard this song? And I'm like, yeah, I want you to meet the two guys. So I went over and I met Face and uh, Mr. Baby Face. Baby Sorry, face. Baby Face. Yes, baby apologies. Face, yeah. And uh, got talking, and his manager turned and said, uh, "They're in the studio tomorrow. Why don't you come down tomorrow?" Was so, that Benny Medina? Huh? No, oh, that's Benny was after. Probably. Uh, Benny came after. Afterwards, right? Yeah. So uh, I go and I I go to the studio and. I get played three songs. This is with Face's voice. Don't be cool. Right? Um, Tender Ronnie. What was the other one? There's another one. The three of them. And he plays me these three songs. And the manager's saying, I think you should do them. I, I'm like, that first tune, right, that they had, right, I was, Don't Be Cruel. This is on this. Just that was on the, 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 first, the, the first mega mega yes, album. Probably bad. 
right? And that don't And he was from New Edition, which yeah, exactly. So, so he, he was been, going solo. He was going solo yeah, at yeah. that time as well. And um, I listened to the three songs, and I'm there, and I'm like, I want these three, right? I lo- I'm, I'm, don't be cool. It's just like for me, that's it, right? But now hear that. I could imagine clubs and and parties and just off of that beat at that time I wanted that I wanted that and then I came back and I said yep I'd do it I'd do it and then they turned around and Benny Medina says he's got this kid from New Edition and Bobby goes in and does Don't Be Cruel Tenderoni and all of these songs and becomes huge my right. prerogative, was my really, prerogative, uh, which is what that was, yeah. uh, Teddy, Teddy, Teddy yeah, yeah, that yeah. was Teddy, that's, that's right, Teddy yes, Ray, he yes. did that one. So that's and, uh, second album. Yeah. But that was it was incredible times again. All it's, these it's, amazing people that you you know meeting and giving you props meeting, and giving everything. you props and wanting yeah. to work with you and stuff Someone like that. Someone else I wanted to mention because sure. I was really surprised when I was reading about it. He was a big hero of mine, and and we're talking about rock music. Was Phil Reiner from Thin Lizzy? Mm-hmm. So you got to work with him about. 84, 85. That's correct. And that must have been amazing. amazing. The same club that just got burnt the other day in Camden. Co- well, you Camden know, Palace. Camden Co- Palace. Co- Palace. Coco's. Yeah. Yeah. Camden Palace. But Camden Palace, yeah. as I knew it. Back in my day in Camden Palace, you'd have everybody there. Absolutely. Rock, pop, yes. R&B, everybody. That's right. In the there. 80s, it was, just, they, it was the, the place. It was the place to yeah. be. And Phil had known. Right, so Phil comes up to me one night, says to me, he wants to do a solo album, right? But he wants to do it with an R and B vibe. Are you up for it? I'm like, of course I'm up for it because I love Thin Lizzy. So there wasn't that many at that time. There wasn't many musicians of color doing rock music, no. really, especially mainstream. No, not at all. I mean, if you really think about it, when and coming from Ireland, yeah, as exactly. Well, come on, coming yeah, from absolutely. Ireland with a broad Irish accent, he was. A maverick, I mean. he was. He was he was just an incredible human being at That's first right and foremost. Yeah. Incredible human being. And he, when I when we met up and we started talking and then we, we, we got together at his house, there was Lemmy, there was John Lemmy. Sykes oh, from wow. White Snake, um, oh, wow. Derek Bramble, um, who was the other one? Um, oh God, it was produced by Tony Visconti as well, right? We're in the studio and we have Mick Jagger and 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 uh, David Bowie coming to the studio one night. And again, these these are after the, the this story goes back to before. So this story goes back at the time, and it it really started when I was a kid. I got an uncle, and he plays bongos, and he knew Mick Jagger, Brian, and all of them. They worked at the same place. They were putting a band together. They, and they wanted to meet, they wanted my uncle in the band, but he'd just come over from Jamaica and he needed, I think he was about 17, 18, so he needed permission from my mum, who was the oldest sibling. So Mick Jagger and Brian come round to the house, talk to my mum, they, I'm in this room, you know, they, talk to my mum, right, and um, my mum's like, it's all good, you know, but it's down to Carlton if he wants to do it or not. So they leave, right? And my mum says to Carlton, um, you want to join the band? My uncle turns and says, nah, man, they're rubbish. None of them can play. Him can't even sing. Oh. Right? <laughs> Never forgot that. <laughs> oh, dear. 20 years on, maybe, or 15 years on, or whenever it is, I'm in the studio, right? And i never forget this, because they were up at the side. So Bowie, Right, and Mick left, and we're talking about this project with Phil and everything. And Mick Jagger turns and says, you don't remember me. He said, said that to you? He said that to me. You don't remember me. So I said, where from? He said, I came to your house. you got an uncle called Carlton. Of course, I remembered him. Right? <laughs> you got <laughs> got uncle called Carlton. So I said, yeah. So he said he was a really good bongo player. You know, we tried to get him in the band, but I think your mum said no. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't have you said it. I never told him anything. I was just so chuffed about the whole oh, thing that he could remember that. How lovely. Uh, and that's, you know, the very beginning of the Rolling Stones. Sure, yes. It was like, you know, they'd all just gotten together. They hadn't cut a record yet, right? But they were in the process of. 
and they wanted him to play bongos. So he could have been wow. a very famous little yeah. person at that time. But music, if I, if I put it this way, music has been part of the family in, in different various forms. Sure. And did, so none of these tracks ever came to life? What you did with Phil? What I did with Phil? Yeah. No, they, they've been put, a few of them have been put up on um, YouTube, which were the demos that we were doing at the okay. time. But the finished product, we, we had a song called The Lady Just Loves to Dance, which was fantastic. A great you title. Hear, great yeah, title. it's a real Finn Lizzy, Phil Liner kind of vibe. Right, in terms of how we did it melodically, um, musically, we stayed rock. We didn't try to go into any R&B field, R&R&B. Yeah. And uh, we presented it, the management company presented it to Polygram, who we were both signed to. And they turned around and said, nah, you know, this black guy doing R&B, being me, right, with this rock guy, and they didn't use a colour for him. Right, Phil always remembers it, right? Because he was the one who told me, like, I can't do a broad Irish accent. Yeah, yeah. But his was like, you know, how dare they turn around and be saying the black guy? What am I? What am I? Am I not a? Per-? And he went off. Phil went off that day. Oh, wow. Right. But we, we, it was taken in. They wouldn't do it because, again, as I said, at that time, racism in terms of the music industry was rife even though they were trying to make out that we were the only industry that was all inclusive mm. it was like it was a bit like being in south africa i suspect do you know what i'm saying sure. it was very much divided in terms of what you would get as a white artist what you would get as a black artist where you would be presented as a black artist to where you would be presented as a white artist so phil doing rock and roll phil being huge in rock and roll Junior doing R and B, let's say R and B rock then, yeah. right? Which they couldn't define. Phil could because he wouldn't have asked me if he didn't see and hear what he was Absolutely. hearing, right? So that period was very much Phil's kind of like first true, I would say, understanding of uh, racism in the way that racism was projected through music. He knew it as, like I did, you know, he knew it as a, a human being, but thinking in music that you could kind of like get away from all of that and be able to project you. And that hit home for Phil. It wasn't so much, because it wasn't him that they were up, they were really on about, it was me. Right. And as I said, as a human being, here, heart, Phil had all of that. He was for real, you know what I'm saying? I. I'll always, always be a fan. Always yeah. be a fan of that person. He was, for me, again, another person who... Another one did the same thing was Paul McCartney. I did a Top of the Pops, and when I did a Top of the Pops, he came to Top of the Pops. He went and bought the record. He rang up the record company, found out where the record was, went to um, Our Price, bought the record. Our yeah, because he made me that, Our Price. Went to Our Price, went and bought the record, and came to Top of the Pops and asked me to sign it. Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney. Wow. Okay. Again, Wonderful. as I'm showing you, but what I'm yeah. trying to show you is, is that I'm not seeing the no. the no. the what the music is doing. Yeah. All I'm doing is making it. Sure. And I'm enjoying that. But the way that the music's being taken on board by my peers and by the audience out out there was, as you, for me, looking back, it was amazing because. You have a Paul McCartney, you have a Mick Jagger, David Bowie, you have all of these artists who are listening, still Rick listening. Rick James, Rick Patti James, LaBelle, Patti you know. LaBelle, Steve You mentioned Pete Patti LaBelle. I'm, I'm, I love LaBelle because I love Nona Hendricks. Oh, I know she's that. And she mixed.